themselves. All welcome to you all welcome to the fifth session of the uh, sixth webinar series of the Nigerian Society of Anesthetists. Today, today we will be discussing um, an overview of critical care, and we have with us the speaker, Dr. Muiwa Rotimi. He's a consultant anesthetist and critical care physician and also a co the coordinator of ICU services at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Idi Araba. And with us here is the moderator, Dr. Ago Edith Ebere. She's a consultant anesthetist and head of the Department of Anesthesia at the Federal Medical Center, Lokoja Kogi State. Then um, today we have with us the president of the Nigerian Society of Anesthetists, Dr. Busola Briggs. We have uh, the immediate past um, president of the NSA, Professor Oboli Mwaso, our secretary general, Dr. Yakubu, and also, of course, the chairman of the education committee of the NSA, uh, Professor Dethi uh, Mohammed, and my humble self, Dr. Rangasu. So we, this webinar we expect to last not uh, just um, a little less than two hours. And I want to invite um, the moderator, Dr. Ago Edith uh, to uh, commence. Dr. Ago, please, you have the floor. Good evening, everyone. The presentation this evening will last for about 35 minutes. We will now invite the Speaker, Dr. Mui Waru to me to take up the stage. Thank you very much, Dr. Agu. Yeah, can you see my screen, please? Yes. Okay. Good evening, professors, trainers, senior colleagues and colleagues. Um, I want to thank the executive members of the uh, Nigeria Society of Anesthetists for this opportunity. And also I want to commend the efforts of um, the Educational Committee for the great work that they are doing. This evening we'll be talking on the overview an overview of critical care. Overview of critical care. Critical care is um, encompassing and um, we'll try to uh, limit the discussion within the time frame given. So the objectives of this lecture will be one to highlight different aspects and components of critical care to demonstrate better understanding of critical care in the ICU, to appreciate the scope of critical care, and to aid focused and targeted approach to critically ill patients. By way of introduction, critical care medicine is an evolving specialty, especially in our environment. COVID-19 pandemic um, make, made it more uh, pronounced before. Most people never knew anything about um, critical care. But after the COVID pandemic, people started talking about life support, ventilators, some people even decided to buy a ventilator and keep at home, thinking that life support is all about uh, vent ventilator. The personnel is also important. So, and since that time, it has gained uh, prominence and people are more aware of uh, critical care, especially in our environment. Intensive care, unit is a specially staffed and equipped hospital ward that is dedicated to the management of critically ill patients with reversible organ dysfunction, life-threatening illness, injuries or complications, who will benefit from care that is not available on the general ward. So intensive care unit, you have staff that are specially trained and you have equipment there in the intensive care unit. So intensive care unit is not, is not an area in which we just push um, 
any doctor or any nurse to and say, okay, go and manage a patient. No, there is need for training. There is need for the people there to be well grounded with um, knowledge and also the equipment, they need to have knowledge of how those equipment um, will be made use of. And um, the patients being managed there should have reversible organ dysfunction. That's why it's underlined. So critical care unit is not a place where you just go and dump um, chronically ill patients or terminally ill patients. No. There is need for the definition of the word spelled out, reversible organ dysfunction. The care there is intensive, just from the word. Critically ill patients who are dead, I will soon get to know more about that. Intensive care unit can also be called intensive therapy unit or intensive treatment unit, depending on um, the location or where you find yourself. And also, can also be called critical care unit, CCU. Let's quickly go through this clinical scenario. You have a 62-year-old non-apotensive diabetic and asthmatic patient who was a victim of road traffic accident that was rushed to the emergency room. She says that presentation was 5 over 15. It was tachycardic with pulse rate of 125 beats per minute. It was hypotensive. It's over 55 and tachypneic, saturating, and despite a non rebreather face mask, at 15 liters per minute, it was doing 85% and it was this leak. But examination revealed bleeding from orofacial orifices, fracture ribs, blood abdominal injury with guarding tenderness and fracture of lung bones. Laboratory investigations shows anemia of 7.2, leukocytosis and uh, phagocytopenia. So, and lactate was elevated. You agree with me that this type of patient is not the patient to be admitted on the ward, a regular ward. These patients need critical care. So intensive care unit caters for patients with reversible or recoverable illness, just with, as we've talked about, which could be severe or life-threatening. It involves close, constant, intensive attention or care by a team of specially trained healthcare providers and level three care. So there are different levels of care. We have level zero, one, two, three. Zero, normal ward care. You have a patient on the ward that maybe requires oxygen therapy. You, you give to the patient. Level one at risk of deteriorating requires support from critical care team. Maybe the patient um, requires blood transfusion, and the patient is hypotensive. And after blood transfusion and other supplementation, the patient gets better. Level two, have a patient with single failing organ or post op cases, or the patient that requires more observation or intervention. Then level three, which refers to IC. So level two could be high dependency unit, while level three is intensive care unit, where you have two or more organs affected and the patient will require advanced respiratory support. There is another classification, and this one is an organizational classification of level of ICU here. So you have level one, level two, level three. Level one located in the district hospital with close nursing observation, basic monitoring is carried out, immediate resuscitation and short-term ventilation too can be done. Level two, this is found in regional general hospital in which um, there's access to support system, the physiotherapy, you need radiological services available. However, complex life support not provided. They can't do invasive monitoring. They can't do dialysis. While level three provides all aspects of ICU care and is staffed with intensivist trainees, nurses, allied healthcare professionals. It supports complex procedures, interventions, invasive monitoring, imaging, CT scan, uh, MRI, and, and so on. So these um, level three usually found in tertiary institutions and some private hospitals. This slide shows the types of ICUs that are available. Models of ICU, it can be divided into open, closed, or semi-closed model. So open ICU is the one where the specialty teams have 
full admitting rights and where an intensivist is merely consulting. So open ICU could be service ICU. Closed ICU is a model where one where the intensivist is admitting medical personnel and the specialty teams collaborate with ICU staff. So close ICU um, or intensivist led team, which is responsible for making clinical decisions. So close ICU, you have an intensivist there, takes decision. However, all the um, physicians or other members of staff can come in, review the patients, but the decision making is left to the intensivist. Open ICU, everybody comes in, make decision, and um, care continues. Semi closed is um, in between the open and closed um, ICU. So some ICUs, they uh, make use of semi closed, while some uh, make use of the closed uh, system. And in some ICUs too, we have the open system. The advantages, closed versus open. There's decreased mortality. That's for closed ICU, because there's high intensity model. There's decreased ICU length of stay, mandatory daily intensivist involvement. We have on-site intensivist coverage, which is not 24 hours. So the intensivist does not really stay in because we there are other members of staff that are present there. There's better coordination of critical care services. There's more cohesive treatment strategy with better leadership and more efficient use of resources. There's also focused critical care skills in the critical care environment. For open ICU, open ICU has its own advantages too. Primary specialists carry on care after ICU admission. So you have a, a maybe a surgeon that uh, just operated a patient and the patient requires ICU care. So the surgeon takes the patient to ICU. And the, the advantage of that, the relatives, they are familiar with the face. So they, they continue, I mean, the surgeon or the physician continues to interface with the um, relatives, unlike the um, close ICU where that may be, I mean, the relatives, they have to get used to um, the new set of uh, members of staff. Workload can be outsourced to allied health staff, e.g. respiratory care technicians, because here you don't have the intensivist that is taking charge. So the respiratory, the patient requires um, ventilatory support, get respiratory technicians, get um, some other people that know about it who handle that. We have physician assistants. So have all those people coming in while the primary physician or the surgeon continues with care. And otherwise, composite not vital information might be lost. There's need for interfering intensivities, which might be favored by a specialist team. ICU setup. How do we set up ICU or what does it entail? ICU requires one to two percent of total hospital beds. So we have hospital with bed capacity of 1,000. So it means that the beds you have there is uh, 10 minimum or maximum of 20. And uh, there is a subdivision into specialized units, if more than 10. So if more than 10, you cannot divide it to, okay, neuro, or you can divide it into medical, surgical, pediatrics or you divide to neuro, cardio, and so on. So, or trauma ICU, you can, that can be divided if it's more than 10. The best space is approximately 20 square meter for infection control and gadget storage. Isolation bed, one per every six ICU bed. Staffing, have intensive a lot and so on. Nurse to patient ratio is one to one because the care is intensive. You have a patient that is being ventilated on anotropic support. You need to do early monitoring. You need to do turning. You need to suction. You need to give medication. So it's one on one. And you, you remember that critically ill patients at times they are unstable. One minute they are stable. The other minute they are not stable. So it's one to one monitoring, and it's round the clock. The care is intensive. So the equipment in ICU. 
then there should be proximity to theater, to accident and emergency area, to areas where you can have radiological investigations done and the laboratory. So how do you set up an ICU? But this um, essentially for um, residents going for exam, especially part two exam. So there's need for assessment. So you need to do need assessment. So if you have a hospital in which but almost every day you have patients presenting there and you are turning patients down. I mean, patients that require ICU care and you are referring to other facilities, referring to other facilities. You need to understand that there is that need for ICU to be situated within that hospital complex. Or if the hospital is um, situated along um, express um, way or busy roads where you have um, victims of road traffic accidents. So such could uh, prompt the institution creating ICU. So the location should be strategically located. Budget, there's need for budget, and this we um, structure the equipment, those consumables. There's need for stakeholders meeting, the three ends, management, manpower, that's human resource, but workforce, and um, fund, money. Engineering too, they have to be involved. Equipment, you need to make a list of equipment that um, will be needed. Then there's need to generate protocols, guidelines, and SOPs. There's need for training, and after commencement, you need to have retraining. There's need for continuous medical education. This plan must be on ground even before you start. And there's need for audit, because you don't just want to start and you have immortality, mortality. You need to assess what you are doing if really you are you are on top of your game or not. And there's need for research. Staff in the ICU, this um, the list of the staff found in the ICU. The other stakeholders invite physicians, surgeons, collaborate. And not only that, those are even non-clinical members of staff. Now, medical engineers, if you have the problems with your ventilator or, or with the equipment in ICU, you need to bring them in. And also, if you have problem with cooling system or there's problem with um, the power. So you need engineering department to be on board and other stakeholders too. The most important thing for all these members of staff is teamwork. Teamwork, very, very important. ICU is an organized area where teamwork is very, very crucial. And um, you don't undermine the, the relevance of members of staff, even the cleaners, the potters, they are very, very important in the discharge of duties, which we culminate in um, favorable outcome. What are the admission criteria? This is in no way exhaustive, just to um, highlight few ones. Admission criteria, whether to defense system, airway or respiratory, we have um, Airway obstruction, pulmonary embolism, with dynamic instability, respiratory arrest, with saturation, despite of oxygen, such supplementation, a cardiovascular, we have CNS, endocrine, OBS, and mode systemic. Scoring system in ICU. So these are tools or severity skills utilized in assessing severity of illness in patients admitted in the unit. So it's an important adjunct of treatment. So it's necessary to assess or as a guide to what we are doing in ICU. So it predicts outcome and can compare um, quality of care, explain differences in mortality, help with stratification for clinical trials, help with decision making at the right time, and it describes ICU population. So the scoring system is usually divided into two parts. We have the severity score and the calculated probability of mortality. So they are, I mean, the scoring systems can um, be done the first day. In our institution, we have Apache and subs that we do at the point of entry or admission into ICU. And um, there are some that you do every day. It's repetitive so, so that you can compare and know, okay, is this patient improving or this patient is deteriorating? 
So this current system should have the following characteristics, Validate, validation, this ability to predict mortality, different population to assemble the score. Then calibration, this talks about, um, it assesses the degree of correlation between estimated probability of mortality and observed mortality. And reliability is inter and intra observer agreement when calculating severity of inner score. So scores can be subjective or objective. So this is another form of classification. So just quickly run through some common ones. Apache 2 is divided into three. So Apache is acute physiology and chronic health evaluation two. And it makes use of um, three components. You have the acute physiology score, which has 12 variables. And you have the age points and the chronic health points. So you have the sum A plus B plus C. So when you have a score, when you put this together and you have a score of 25, it gives a predicted mortality of about 50%. When you have a score greater than 35, the predicted mortality is about 80%. Apache 2 has good calibration and um, discriminatory value. So, and it can be used across um, different disease process. So the other one is SAPS, Simplified Acute Physiology Score. So that also makes use of some variables. Then we have sequential organ, um, Failure assessment, and also we can have quick software. Quick software just mixes of three uh, parameters: the uh, blood pressure less than still blood pressure less than hundred, respiratory rate greater than twenty seconds per minute, and um, level of consciousness less than forty. So that can quickly give you that assessment, and it can guide what you do. That's what coma scale is commonly used. So these are the equipment that we have in ICU. You can go through it and see the ones that you have in your facility, if you have enough or you need to procure more. So this picture shows some of the equipment. We have um, the ventilator, we have docking station where you have syringe drivers and infusion pump. You have ABG, depending, this is the portable and held type. Then um, you have the monitor, you have the pneumatic compression device, Lotron, and um, you have the air blend machine that high flow mesa oxygen. And you have a uh, body warmer in case the patient is hypothermic and you need to keep the patient warm. Procedures in ICU, bacteria, catheterization, central venous foundation, and so on. These are the procedures that make use of ICU. Oxygen therapy, what we do in, in ICU is majorly organ support, organ support. And when you talk about organ support, you are talking about oxygen therapy. So very, very important. And you need to understand the components. So oxygen delivery, oxygen flux, what are the components? So when you have a patient that um, needs this organ support, you need to factor in some things. So the cardiac output, very, very important. The hemoglobin, very, very important, the saturation, and also the partial pressure of oxygen. So this equation is very, very important and um, is relevant in IC. Oxygen delivery devices, we have fixed and very weak performance. So approach to a critically ill patient, there is need for us to be systematic and be coordinated in an approach to critically ill patients so that we not miss out in the management of this patient. There are different ways. You can make use of the A, B, C, D, E, F, G approach, in which every day you assess the airway, and these are the components, breathing, uh, component, circulation, drugs, disability. You review drugs every day. You assess the level of consciousness. Exposure, you check the skin. Then the doctor's also and um, also check temperature. Then the laboratory investigations, you want to assess it. Three, you want to check input output. Is this patient overloaded? Is this patient 
um, dehydrated, not getting enough and so on, feeds too, very important. Then the glucose. So another approach is uh, fast hog beets, which was uh, popularized by Jane Vincent in 2005 and was updated by Vincent Atin. So fast hog beets talk about the air feed and feed, analgesia, sedation, probable prophylaxis, which could be pharmacological or not pharmacological. You have head up about 30 to 45 degrees, also prophylaxis, critical illness is associated with um, increased stress response. So patients may have stress ulcer, so you need to uh, prevent it. And also patients, they don't, um, the feeding or nutrition is not usually commenced early and some they may not even be able to feed. So there is need to have ulcer prophylaxis. Glucose monitoring, very, very important because of the stress response to critical illness. Sedation, vacation, spontaneous breathing trial, the skin integrity, the bowel care too, you have to check. Some patients may not even move bowel for a week. So you need to check and know what's happening. And some may even, it may even be in excess, passing loose stool. And until you ask, you may not even know that patient has been passing uh, loose stool. You may just be seeing that potassium has just been um, low, hypokalemia. So you need to find out that and um, so that the necessary action can take. Indwelling catheter is not only about um, foolish catheter, or silicon catheter. Any catheter, is it a central catheter or arterial or chest tube, you need to check it. Then the escalation of antibiotics. I notice in, in ICU, we tend to at times forget about um, antibiotics. So you have a patient that is on fly G for two weeks, patient on meropenem for two weeks, patient on some antibiotics. So there is need for us to check and also de-escalate as necessary. Mechanical ventilation, this can be divided into non-invasive and invasive. Non-invasive, you have continuous positive air pressure and bi-level positive airway pressure. And the invasive, we have different modes under invasive. So this picture on the left, you have a patient on CPAP, NIV, and these are the parameters. And on the right, you have a patient on the invasive. So the, we check, at the bottom, we have different modes there. It's VAC, that's volume assist or control. You have the pressure assist control. You have the volume SIMV. You have the pressure SIMV. You have the CPAP of PSV. You have the pressure regulated volume control and pressure regulated volume control SIMV, dual level and APRV. So these are the modes that um, we have on the ventilator. This slide just captures everything about mechanical ventilation, excess of ventilation, oxygenation, ventilation, patient comfort, facilitate weaning. So it, it um, serves as a guide to um, ventilation. So we have another clinical scenario. We have a 28-year-old asthmatic patient that presents with this. Um, ABG shows pH of 7.12, PO2 65, PC, O2 76 by coming of 26, FL2 of 0 0.5. Oh, we are assessment and management of this patient. Would you like to intubate this patient? If this condition becomes severe, will you ventilate this patient? What will be the ventilatory parameters of this patient? So we need to ponder on that. Mechanical ventilation. So these are indications for mechanical ventilation or as in to initiate mechanical ventilation. Then to bring it, I mean, to simplify it, so you have respiratory rate that's greater than 35 or less than 8. Being that uh, has exhaustion with labeled pattern of breathing, hypoxemia, hypercapia, increasing conscious level, significant chest trauma, a low tidal volume. Ventilator associated pneumonia, this type of pneumonia occurring more than 48 hours after you've initiated. Um, ventilation, you've intubated and commenced mechanical ventilation to patients. So you've done that and just one that, like maybe third day, patients started having fever, patients started bringing out secretions and so on. So there's need for high index of suspicion in such a patient. So diagnosis requires high clinical suspicion, bedside examination, radiographic or radiological examination, and you can do microbiology analysis of respiratory secretion. So there's need for aggressive surveillance to predict, I mean, to assess the 
predisposing factor and also the micro milieu of the unit. There is need for judicious antibiotic usage and simple nursing respiratory therapy very important. So potential strategies. So this um, one can use this in management of BAP prior to intubation, what to do, process of intubation, what to do, after intubation, what to do, and after intubation, this is controversial anyway. Early versus late enterophy. So this is just a guide to prevent that. So after you've commenced um, ventilation and patient is doing well, when do you win or there's need for winning? So ready winning, ready breathing, ready extubation. So there is there must be the reversal of the primary problem for which um, the patient was commenced on ventilatory support. This um, slide shows the algorithm. So you have daily assessment for spontaneous breathing trial, clinical stability, adequate maintenance. You don't win a patient that is still drowsy and patient is not, I mean, does not have adequate maintenance. You don't win a patient that is still on triple anotropic support. You don't win a patient that the saturation, you still require PEEP of 10, PEEP of 12. So all these things, they have to be taken into consideration. And another thing too, that is very important winning is um, RSPI. So that's rapid shallow breathing index. So this is a tidal volume over respiratory rate, and it should be less than 105. Saturated blood gas analysis is very, very important in ICU. Whenever you have a patient in ICU that's mechanically ventilated, it's mandatory to have arterial blood gas analysis because you may not know where you are at time. We admitted a patient in my institution, an unconscious patient, and the, the, at the time of um, admission, the pH was very low, I think 7.12. And the PCO2 was very, very elevated, above 80. So the patient had respiratory acidosis. So such a patient, and she was unconscious. Such a patient, we had to intubate and hyperventilate. So when you hyperventilate, how do you know where you are? So you have to repeat ABG to know where you are at time so that you won't over hyperventilate as well. So very, very important. So normal values for ABG is um, necessary. So, this just shows um, what happens with it. Sedation in ICU, very, very important. Sedation will make use of benzodiazepines and um, opioids. So, and this table shows um, the action and also the adverse effects. And then um, also this table gives us uh, more comprehensive uh, details. We can also make use of propofol, especially for um, neuro patients. So, but we need to be careful because of people for infusion syndrome, which is uh, the limitation to that. So when a patient is sedated, there's need to assess. So we need to assess if it's too much or it's not enough. So we have scoring system too for assessment. One of it is RAS, that's which one activation and sedation scale. So it's not enough to say patient is sedated. You need to know, you need to speak the language. What is the RAS score? Or if you don't want to make use of RAS or is the Ramsey sedation score, you need to know the Ramsey sedation score. So because you have some patients that are intubated, they are wide awake and patient is fighting and, and the patient is sedated. So the patient is not sedated because you need the patient to be calm. You don't want to further aggravate the um, stress response. So there's need and also healing for healing to take place. So there's need for sedation to, to be done and it should be well guided. Indication, so hemodynamic monitoring in ICU. So there's need for hemodynamic monitoring in ICU. And um, a patient that is hypotensive and on anthropic support should have invasive monitoring on. So when you have a patient that is hypotensive and you started noradrenaline, started to put you needed to add adrenaline or you needed to add mesopressin and patient does not have invasive monitoring. That is not standard practice. So there is need for invasive monitoring 
and you monitor the patient um, well. So this is about um, the CBP. There's need for CBP monitoring too, though it has its own um, limitation too, but there's need, it can guide field administration in ICU. Anotropic and vasopressor support, nephrine, dicotamine, adrenaline, vasopressin. So they have their own um, range of doses and they are titrated to effect. So you should um, stay within the limit because if you exceed it, you start having the side effects of the patient and peripheral visual constriction may happen. You just find that the digits just become dusky and also the um, compromise to gut circulation, renal and so on. So there is need to to stay within the limit. Nutrition I see is very, very important. This kind of is associated with malnutrition because catabolism is more than anabolism. The route of administration, oral, enteral, parenteral. The most physiological one that is, um, that is advocated is oral. But if the patient cannot take by mouth, then you can pass NG tube or give peg tube and you still feed. But if there are contraindications to this, then you can do parenteral. This shows um, nutrients that was given to the patient. So enteral versus parenteral cost. Um, definitely parenteral is more expensive because you have to set the central line. Though we have some um, enter, I mean, parenteral feeds that can be given by the peripheral line. They have low osmolality. So, but if you have the eye um, the, the ones with eye osmolarity, you may have to set central line. And also managing central line too is another thing. So the cost is then also the fees. It can take, I mean, for parental life, it can take up like 35 to 50,000 per day. Got integrity is preserved in enteral feed. Infection rate less in enteral compared to parental. Complications. Definitely is less with enteral compared to parenteral, where you have mechanical complications, infections, sepsis, metabolic complications, and gastrointestinal. So nutrition ICU, we work with calorie intake. So calorie, protein, and fluid. So if normal LD 70 kg man requires 25 to 30 kilo cal per kg per day, an ICU patient will require more than that. So critically ill patients, Require 10 to 35. And if you now have patients with bones, then you will need a lot more, 30 to 40. Protein you can do one to two grams per kg per day. Then fluid, you have to individualize it. There are times that you need to give fluid, and times you have to restrict fluid in them. Critically, the patients that are immobile. So, and that's the reason why early ambulation is important. So, this is what happens. Uh, muscle weakness, there is increased hospital length of stay, ICU length of stay, quality of life is reduced, time on ventilation too is increased, physical ability to is reduced. So all this will affect the outcome at the end of the day. So and these are the systemic effects of immobility. So as early as possible, make sure the patients are mobilized. The patient can start by sitting in bed or sitting out of bed, then gradual mobilization very, very important. Not only for, I mean, preventing DVT or preventing PE, but generally because most wastage, myopathy, poly, um, neuropathy, and so on. So it's very, very important for patients to be, to, to move by time. Sepsis, sepsis is, well, we can't exhaust sepsis in this overview, but it's just for us to remember that sepsis is, is real in ICU. And um, there's an approach to that on the source control and um, source identification, you have targeted therapy. Then you can, while you are doing that source control, you can continue with substation with fluid vasopressor. And you can check your SCBO2. Infection prevention and control is very, very important too in ICU. Chain of infection. So you have um, infectious agents in reservoirs, portal of exit, means of transmission, 
quarter of NTA and you have success, successful hosts, then you have another infectious agent coming in. So you have this chain of infect. So the idea is to break that chain at any point. So once you're able to break the chain, then you be um, you that is you have a favorable good outcome at the end of the day. So type of infection I see you. Well you have five minutes more. Oh, okay, thank you. So we have catheter associated, central associated, surgical site infection, and ventilator associated. So standard precaution. Then there's antibiotic stewardship. Antibiotic stewardship, very, very important. In our institution, we have antibiotic stewardship. It's very, very important because of resistance. We have people prescribing antibiotics without the patient um, in need of it. And you have antibiotics prescribed for a longer than expected time. So there is need for us to be well guided. The goals of antimicrobial stewardship is five Ds. The right drug, the right dose, the right drug route, the right duration, and timely escalation to pathogen directed therapy. That's what we call targeted therapy. So that's the goal. There's need for us to have that. Care bundles. The care bundle is a group of three to five evidence based interventions, which, when performed together, have a better outcome than if performed individually. It's um, an, a form of an audit tool that can help and guide um, the care in ICU. So a high level of adherence to all components is very, very important. So if you have care bundle and you just you decide to adhere to maybe the five, you decide to adhere to three or four, leaving the last one, it will affect the overall um, outcome. So these are examples of Bundle. So point of care, this is gaining prominence in ICU. So, and it's, it's very, very, very important and crucial. You make diagnosis and you can institute intervention right there with your point of care. So it's um, very, very important in ICU. Time will not permit us to have gone through um, different aspects. So ethical issues in ICU, brainstem death, withholding or withdrawal of life support, CPR for how long, do not resuscitate or do not attempt resuscitation, advanced directive, futile care, end of life care. Should a cancer patient be admitted in ICU, or let me rephrase it this way, should all cancer patients be admitted in the ICU? So at times you want to, you don't know, should I admit this patient? Should I not admit this patient? And um, is it this, what this patient has, is it related to the cancer, um, the, the pathology that he has, or another thing entirely? So you won't need to be able to decide. So communication and documentation are very, very important in ICU. You maintain closed loop communication. You should know how to communicate with colleagues, you know how to communicate with other team members, you know how to communicate with patients and even patient relatives. You must be empathetic. You must give daily updates to the patient. Then also you must know how to communicate with hospital management. You need this, you want these consumables, um, they're exhausted, you want replacement for things, you want, uh, so there's need to communicate. And not only communication, document. If you don't or didn't document, it means that it's not done. I'm sure we've seen um, this before on social media that um, besides your clinical skills, there are five things that protect you from medical legal problems. Communication, documentation, communication of documentation, documentation of communication, and preservation of documentation. So they are all important. What are the requirements in ICU for those working there? Teamwork, very, very important. Multidisciplinary team. They must work hand in hand to ensure that common goal is achieved. Good interpersonal relationship. ICU is high tension area. So you must, you must be able to 
relate well. Don't be temperamental. You should work amicably with all members of staff. Hard work, training, skill acquisition, resilience, communication, collaboration, support. Challenges of critical care as a runoff. Inadequate functional ICU facilities. I say functional ICU facilities. We have some ICUs that are really not functional. They don't have equipment. They don't have the human resource. They don't have the workforce. They don't have. So there is need for us to have that. So it's a challenge. We have patients that require ICU admission and there's no bed space. There's nothing. So there's also the problem of staffing as uh, complicated by brain drain, as lack of certification, um, lack of funding, lack of equipment, burnout syndrome, insurance, and cost. In ICU, um, in Lagos, the, I mean, most private ICUs, the minimum you can get at, of um, admission deposit is 1 million. Most ICUs is 1.5, 2 million, 2.5. So in institution, as in, it's the cheapest, I can say. So it's, even with, with what we even have, most patients cannot afford it. We have indigent patients. So how do we, how do we sort that out? So cost, very, very important. And apart from the admission deposit, daily cost too has to be factored. And you have some patients stay in ICU two weeks, one month, two months. In conclusion, critical care involves holistic approach to patients that have severe illness, which is reversible. It has a wide scope and each aspect is crucial and intertwined for favorable outcome. Care of ICU patients, though highly demanding, it's also rewarding. These are my references. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Rotimi, for the very educating uh, overview of critical care. In the next uh, 10, 15 to 20 minutes, we'll take time to ask questions, make comments. Then uh, we can do it in, in, in the following ways. You can indicate by raising of your hands or by putting up the question or comment in the chat session. So time for questions and answers and comments. So should I attend to the questions on the chat box or we attend to the participants raising their electronic hands? How do you go about it, madam? Okay, let's start with those raising their hands. Okay. I, I would suggest he attends to the questions on the chat box if there are no hands up yet. Okay. There are four, there are four hands raised. You, you can what call on you can call on them individually. You give them the floor so that each person knows that he has the floor. Oh, okay. Okay, Undaba Sipuka, your hand is raised. Uh, hello, thank you so much. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. My name is uh, Dr. Ndava Sipuka. I'm, I'm uh, an anesthesiologist from, from Zambia. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this uh, initiative, for this presentation, and indeed for this capacity building. I think we need we need more of such uh, communication, you know, uh, networking for us to advocate for critical care. Um, you understand and agree with me that critical care is still an underrated, underestimated uh, faculty yeah. or medical specialty in most countries, especially in Africa. Yes. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is recognition. I tend to lump anesthesia and critical care. I put them in the same bucket. And then the issue we have with this profession is recognition. 
you will see that critical care cuts across all clinical areas, uh, wherever there's a patient, a, a critical care exerts its influence. So I think we, we really have a lot of work to do. Uh, I know we have challenges with resources, equipment, you know, political will, policy. As much as those may be the key issues for us to develop and expand the field of critical care, the simplest thing we can do is to teach. And I'm glad that I think recently our societies have really been coming up with these such platforms where we, you know, we can showcase, we can share knowledge about critical care. And this is a very good example of one of them. We really, really need to push. We really need to advocate. And for me, teaching is the simplest thing we can do effortlessly. Everything else, you need funding, you need to buy this, you need to buy that, it's expensive. But I think we can start with one step. And so far, uh, these webinars, I think, I think they've, they've been very useful in discussing critical care issues. It's one way we can showcase and share this information with, 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 with powers that may be so that maybe one day critical care will receive as much attention as HIV, as much attention as maternal and child health and all of those things. I think that it's, it's high time we pushed for these agendas. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do back home is to sort of come up with deliberate uh, trainings, you know, short courses, things like basic uh, critical care, where uh, we, 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 we do invite not necessarily people from within the critical care faculty, but we, we want to diversify and, uh, you know, and make sure that people are equipped with the basic knowledge that they need in order for them to manage a very sick patient because we are very few as specialists. So I just want to applaud you uh, for, this, for this initiative. We need much more of this uh, for us to push the critical care uh, you know, uh, agenda forward. So mine is just to thank you for the knowledge shared and, and, the, and the initiative to, to educate a uh, so many people on the on the you know on the african continent continent more, more, more in particular so thank you so much uh, i submit uh, the chair thank you thank you very much sir um well your comments well noted and um, i want to say that in nigeria intensive and critical care society they have been working tirelessly to ensure that um, critical care in Nigeria um, is giving um, the necessary publicity. So we have plans and we started um, executing some of those plans. It's work in progress. And I quite agree with you. Advocacy is very, very important. And we need people to be at the ends of our fear. It's not only to just um, sit down in the ICU. We need people to, to represent us at uh, decision-making uh, fora, so that whatever decision is made, it will be in favor of um, ICU. Then you talk about teaching, training. Fine, fantastic. But when you teach and you train and you don't have equipment to work with, or you don't have ICU that is, um, is well configured to exhibit all these things. The teaching at the end of the day will, will not be made use of and people tend to forget. So there's need to, to mend the two together. The teaching, then you practice. You teach, you train. But I agree with you, at least teaching, if you continue to teach and you train, I'm sure one day we'll get there. Thank you very much, sir. Prof, ma. Prof. Papa you can ask your question. Thank you very much, Dr. Rotimi. Yes, that sir. was very good. Covered very most good. aspects. Very good. Well done. I have a few comments and some questions. Now, yes, you talked about the open and the closed ICU. Um, and you made a statement about the closed ICU that the intensivist does not have to be there 24 hours. Is that what you really said? I would have thought that it's in the 
open where you don't have the intensivists being there. But um, in the closed system, in terms of CVs, it's not, it might not be just a particular person, but like the people that is working with, since it's a teamwork, there will be a complementary team that is in charge of the ICU every day. I wouldn't know what you mean by that statement anyway. Um, please clarify. Two, um, we also talk about open and closed ICUs. And most times I seem to get the impression that anesthetists are the helm of affairs in most ICUs. And when I teach the medical students, I say that in 96% of the places, um, most ICUs in Nigeria are headed by anesthetists. Now, do we have any figures supporting that? Or is, can it be something that we can just do a quick survey across the various, uh, maybe the teaching hospitals with their ICUs and find out who is essentially, who is in charge? Um, I seem to get a feeling when you go around on accreditation that some of us, some of the anesthesia departments are not with, some of the anesthetists there are not willing to even head the place, probably because of shortage of staff and the body that goes on with the ICU. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, a lot of burnt out goes out with um, practicing ICU for day, for years, especially when you don't have enough staff. Uh, it's very hectic. It's a lot more committing than when you have theta anesthesia sessions. Uh, I think you can also comment about that. Um, overall, when we talk about the care in the ICU, we must always remember that central to the practice and the um, management of the critically ill patient is resuscitation. And as you have put out all the tables, people should remember that we're talking about first and foremost, if a patient is diagnosed as being critically ill, he needs resuscitation following the ABC standards and what you look at. And that's why he's coming in first for that. And if other, um, what we call the primary physicians coming, they're just adding to whatever you are doing there, but the survival of that patient depends on adequate resuscitation. So we must, we must, we must remember that. Have you ever come across the three M's that we talked about? Uh, man, machinery, money. Manpower, machinery, money. Can you relate to that? Are we still talking about that in critical care these days? Thank you very much for all what you have said. I enjoyed myself. Thank you very much, Ma, for that valid comment, Ma. Okay, so I talked about closed ICU. What I meant is that closed ICU, you don't have the intensivist that sleeps in. That's my own understanding. You could have, the intensivist is the one in charge. So, because if you have intensivist that sleeps in round the clock, then gone out will be inevitable. But you have um, middle CADA personnel that know what they are doing and they are on ground. So, but the main intensivist will do the round and take charge but not necessarily sleep in two, four, seven. And the, you will have people that are well-trained, the residents that are well-trained and they're on ground. They are not intensivists. They, 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 they may be trainee intensivists or you have anesthetist. So for the intensivists, they don't stay, but they are the ones in charge. That's what I meant by that statement, man. Just like you rightly said, in Nigeria, most ICUs, they are manned by anesthetists. There is a sentence under your slides for um, um, closed ICU that intensivist does not have to be there for 24 hours. Please clarify. Now your explanation is contrary to what... Eluma. Eluma, the, it's breaking, man. It's not clear. Oh, 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 oh,
so that when people are doing slides, they don't, that intensity doesn't have to be there. Okay, okay ma'am. Hello. Hello. Okay, so the, yeah, it's, it wasn't Hello. clear, ma'am, the last thing you said. But I will, I will continue. Maybe we will we'll revisit it later. So for the, the anesthetic, most ICUs, they are manned by anesthetists. And um, so there is need. I'm, I'm not aware of any study um, that shows the level of uh, manpower or the level of personnel manning ICU. So it's something that is um, body of carrying out so that we can, we can have the number of ICUs in the country and who are the people that are in charge of this ICU is, is um, necessary. And just like you said too, um, the sustaination is key, is central to our practice. So when you have critical patients, resuscitation um, will kick in and it's ongoing part time, depending on the clinical state of the patient. Thank you. My, my prof, sir. Professor Shinaike, sir. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, everybody. Um, Dr. Shinaike Babatunde, the president of the Intensive and Critical Care Society of Nigeria. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Rotemi, who is a worthy ambassador of the Critical Care Society uh, in Nigeria. Um, I have a few comments to make, some clarifications, and I will make some comments. And uh, maybe I should just start from what uh, you are discussing with Professor Fakman Lee. And uh, let me state that uh, I, what I've seen in UK and in Middle East is that the intensivist does not sleep over in the ICU. He walks eight to four, eight to five, and the ICU is subsequently manned by um, middle level uh, MAMPA, but the intensive is actually on call. It can be called anytime. anytime. So, anytime it can be called. But because it doesn't sleep over, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It can be called at any time. Okay. Yes, so, I think uh, we should note that. The other thing she asked, and I, I expected she should have given her the answer about. A, a study on personnel in Nigeria. We just published a study, the Intensive and Critical Care Society just published a, a study two years ago on the manpower uh, 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 um, status in Nigeria. Though it was um, a questionnaire survey, uh, the number of ICU involved were not too many, but in that paper, we're able to establish that at least 90% of ICUs in Nigeria are manned by anesthetists. You can check the paper. It's overview of intensive care units in Nigeria. It's published by Journal of Critical Care. Okay. So you can see a lot of things about ICU in that paper. Okay. So I think it's important to state that. Also in that paper, you can actually see <laughs> the number of ICUs that state that in. 2019, in the study I, uh, I organized in Nigeria, the Nigerian Surgical Outcome Study, in that study, we were able to record 385 ICUs in Nigeria. And um, the, you can, if you want to know details, check the paper, Nigerian Surgical Outcome Study. It will give you an idea of the ICUs we reported that we had in Nigeria at that time. Then during the COVID era in 2020, I led a survey in Nigeria. 2020, okay? And in that study, I mean, that quick survey that I led, uh, it was organized by the, our society too, but I led the study. And we discovered that at that time, we had just around um, 400, 44 uh, beds 
and the number of ventilators were actually less than 400. Uh, Lagos had the highest, uh, then followed by Abuja. So the, the details of that, the details of that, I think if you, if you check the, the paper we published in 2019, you can find some of the details there in the overview of intensive care uh, paper that we published. I think that should help us. Okay, now let me now make some comments. Um, admission protocol, yeah, you, I think because an overview, I think is good what you have done, but just, I want to use this opportunity to say that our society is going to publish a guide for us in Nigeria on criteria for intensive care. It, it will be a protocol on um, admission. Actually, the guideline committee is working and very soon we have guidelines and protocol on different aspects of critical care in Nigeria. Please expect that. Then also I want to state that critical care is not limited to the four walls of the intensive care. Please let us note that. And that, uh, I will link that to what the man from Zambia said. That is why training is so important. We are, you can't limit critical care to the four walls of the ICU. So some level of critical care will still take place on the wards, okay? Before the patient gets to the main ICU. And that's why training and training is very important. So we should emphasize that, that even the ICU team should go to the ward and offer some critical care because your four ward, the four walls of the ICU cannot take all the patients. Just imagine how many beds do you have? So you see offer some critical care to the patient outside the ICU. And that is what is called critical, critical care outreach, okay? So critical care should extend outside the ICU. That will help our patients the more. Now, uh, Finally, I will talk about uh, some limitations. I think he has mentioned manpower limitations. Um, payment, ICU payment is a major challenge in Nigeria. And over everywhere I've been to, nobody pays for ICU out of pocket. In Nigeria is out of pocket and that limits what you can do. That makes it difficult for patients to afford the care. Even you as a doctor, you can't afford ICU care. Not to talk of other, other I, mean, uh, I mean, people who are not doctors. So. We, we, we have been trying to engage the Federal Minister of Health in a way that we can see how critical care can be part of the National Health Insurance scheme, that people can benefit from some, from, some, from, some, from some of insurance. It's not a cheap thing, very expensive. I mean, so it, it's a challenge that uh, we, all have to, we, we all have to fight the government to ensure that uh, the government supports critical care. They are looking at it as something that's not too important, but at the end of the day, when they this, this care, they muzzle all the strength they have, or they leave the country, and others are not able to do that. So uh, that, that affects our equipment uh, purchase. Then the other area is training. I must say that we are still limited in terms of training in critical care in Nigeria. But uh, for now, people who are interested can get some training outside. But I want to assure you that in very soon, I can't promise when, uh, we are going to, we are working on how we can start some form of training uh even if it's just a diploma level or certificate level in nigeria and that is uh, something we are working on for the benefit of uh, our our population then finally i also want to say that um our society is um also we all i'm sure we are aware of numerous trainings and webinars we have this year is going to really be busy for us as a lot of workshops are coming up, uh, where we'll be partnering with uh, societies in UK, societies in India, and it's going to really drive our training capacity in Nigeria. So I want to say that, yes, it's a good thing we have had this today to sensitize us. And I want to use this to appeal to, as uh, Professor Fafonde uh, mentioned, many of us are running away from physical care. We know the challenges, but it's, an, it's a place we cannot come together to support the system and support uh, those of us who are there and make uh, things better for our people. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Mr. President, sir. Your comments are highly appreciated, sir. Techno Pop 4, right. Who is that, please? 
Good evening. Hello. Yes. I'm Dr. Sha Usman Panda. Go ahead. From uh, an anesthetist from FTH Gombe. Hello. Are you hearing me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Actually, uh, on what the man from Zambia said, we anesthetized ourselves. We did not really uh, recognize ourselves to some extent as critical care uh, uh, physicians. May, because we don't issue ourselves certificate. You know, anything you don't, you, as you said, anything you do not write, I'm not doing it. In our certificate of training, usually it's only anesthesia we see. Despite all the training, different training that we used to have in critical care and the service we render. To the extent that some nurses now are claiming that uh, they are the only people that are certified to care for patients in critical care. So I think it's high time for us to be issuing ourselves some certificates and document to indicate really we have skill and also we are we have, we have commitment to the service of critical care. Then my question is uh, an issue of, uh, and I'm even thinking that it's high time we might even think of asking for critical care allowance for anesthetists. Because if you look at the workload that is adding to our service, it's uh, actually it's overwhelming, actually. Especially where you have limited manpower, especially with the current brain drain. Then um, our another thing, I, I, I want to hear your suggestion about the ethical issue of patient that need critical care. You have already admitted him. At the mid of the care, he cannot um, continue because of the out of pocket. That, as we said, the sure. most of the are spending out of pocket. So, at the time you are doing patient to critical care. You have you are you are managing him, and the relative will say they are exhausted, they are overwhelmed, they cannot continue the management. So at, at that point, you know the patient is not supposed to go outside the critical care ethically, and there are a lot of uh, social uh, other reasons. So how do we come? At, at times, in some institution, you have social welfare that uh, used to assist. And at times they will tell you the, the, those uh, kind of uh, social care, they will say they don't have uh, the, maybe the uh, uh, ability or the finance or the, 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 the something that they can support the patient. And the patient need critical care. And the relatives are saying they, they are exhausted. And so how do you go about this one? And at times uh, social rule will say that uh, they, 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 unlike emergency, what they, uh, in theater they will say, patient for emergency, continue care, they will pay later. In critical care, you see somebody need admission, is dying, or he, and he need just some intervention, but the rule did not permit you to admit. You have just right, admit, and go and wait. And at time, relative will refuse to, cannot afford, or they will refuse to pay, and there is no such care. So I think also we might even also advocate for the way people, uh, the, way, the way patients are served in the theater, emergency cases, they pay after service. Maybe critical care also, we may advocate for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for, for those comments. Um, well, let me start with the last question you asked. You have a patient that um, relatives are exhausted financially and um, they've been out of pocket and they, they get to a point that they can't go any further and this patient is already in your unit. Okay, so there is need to have um, a meeting with them. You need to communicate with them and also with the hospital management. So, and um, get social workers involved and so on. My own opinion is that you work within what is available and um, then, then you can engage them on modality of, of payment, even after discharge. So it's doable. So you work, if, for example, you have a patient that requires some expensive medication and is not available, you let the relatives know that this patient needs this, it's not available. So because you, is, you, you need to be able to strike balance because at the end of the day, if they are not aware and you, I mean, the patient is now denied. So it is going to cause a lot of issues. So there is a need for them to be carried along and there is a need for them to be aware of the consequences of those 
medications or those things not being available if they're not given. So it's a function of communication and also you carry the relevant authorities along. You talk about certificates. You know, certification is very, very important. I'm sure uh, president of ICCSN is hearing you. And just like you said, there are many things that um, ICCSN is working on. And part of it is training with certification. So concerning critical care allowance, well, I really don't know about that. It's something that we can push for and um, hopefully we'll get a positive response. Thank you very much, sir. Doctor, look to me. Yes. Please quickly go over to the chat. There are some questions there. So that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me quickly go through the chat. Doctor. Okay, let me read out some of them. One asks about uh, how do we get reference? I think uh, the NSA is now uh, providing opportunity for even for those that didn't participate to have the the uh, the, the presentation at their leisure. Then one Dr. Mwaegu said uh, he wants to know the meaning of the abbreviation SBR. Okay, SBI is spontaneous breathing trial. Dr. Ali Uheda. Spontaneous breathing trial. Okay, Dr. Ali Uheda. Heda. S S B R. R. S B R. Yes. Dr. Ali Uheda said, "Can we use inhalational agents to sedate patients in ICU?" Uh, inhalational agent via what route? Are we going to bring the horizon into the ICU? We don't use inhalational agents in ICU for sedation. We use um, intravenous agents. I'm not aware of inhalational okay. agents being used in the ICU. Dr. Lolo Isaac also raised an ethical issue. Said most of the other physicians say intens intensivists tend to play God when they deny patients of admission on account of irreversibility of organ damage. He now says, what, what now with the scoring, the aperture scoring, of, of predicting a poor progress for a patient? When can the intensivist now decline the admission in, in ICU? As, uh, this question is always a recurrent issue. So can you answer it? OK. Thank you very much, Ma. And thank you to the person that asked the question. So when this current system, like I said, is meant to guide your decision and also to give you an idea of the prognosis at the end of the day. So it's not a criterion for declining patients because it's a guide. If you assess it and find out probability, I mean, the possibility of, um, of demise is high, that shouldn't mean you should decline because you give everybody fair chance, more so if they're really, they able to pay. So you, it will guide your management that fine, just keep giving your best because there are some that you even think that, so I've seen a patient that came into ICU with six organ failures and everybody thought that, mm, is uh, this man who may not really make it. And we just kept on, kept on, I mean, the patient made it and the patient was discharged. So it's a guide and that shouldn't really, um, shouldn't um, make us to decline patients any admission. Then he said, most times other physicians say intensive, intensivists tend to play God when they decline admission of, we're well, we not playing God and we don't even intend to do that. We, we are just, whatever decision we make, we are making it based on available knowledge that we have and also based on experience. So, and at times we need to try hard. So if you have a bed space and you have two patients contending for that bed space, you need to try hard and say, oh, looking at these parameters and looking at these other parameters, we think that this patient will benefit more or this patient has better or higher chances of survival compared to this person. Because two or three of them that contending for that bed. So 
we take the ones that we think should be able to uh, pull through, and the other ones, we tell them that there's no space, there's really nothing you can do. So we're not playing go, we're just trying to, to um, execute what we've learned. Thank you. Next question, please. In absence, any more Hello. questions? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for the session. In absence of any further questions, I now invite the president, the NSA president to give her own comments. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you once again. Good um, evening, Mom. <laughs> this subject has been a very um, well attended one that has brought so many together. Some of you are regular attendees, but I must say it's exciting to have a lot of stalwarts in NSA and intensive care NAMIS today. Um, this includes the president of Intensive Cancer, Professor Vadosh Naike, I welcome you. Um, the former president of Intensive and Critical Care Society of Nigeria, our People's General, Ogubiyi, welcome. We also have um, Professor Fakon Le here, the chairman of um, the West African College of Surgeons, Professor Inia Basilori. Thank you for always keeping a date with us. And um, I also have here Dr. Tola Olatosi, the former surgeon of WAX. Professor Desali was also here. We, I'm also happy to have all of you here. I hope we'll see more of you. And of course, I have um, Dr. Jegri, Dr. Jaro, the Kalan of Degri, and the former, I think um, you're, the, you're the former NMA um, chair of ICU and payment. I mean, Dr. Jegri, are you still around? Hello, Dr. Jegri. Okay, maybe he has gone. So, um, and I also want to. I'm around, but good evening. Oh, Dr. Gregory, very nice having you. You're still the chairman of Pain and Intensive Care Unit of NMA. Are you? I'm not. Uh, the Dr. Uh... Okay. okay, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and also, I must welcome all our East and Central African colleagues. We're so happy to have you here. We've taken note of your um, word of admonition to us to do more of this um, collaboration and networking in discussions. I must say that um, intensive care, critical care indeed is an all encompassing subject. I, 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 I thank you, Dr. Rotimi for dealing with this. I had no doubt that you will do justice to this. And um, to every one of you present here, I, I, I want to say thank you so very much for making it a date with us. I would not um, waste our time too much with um, too many um, things to say. Um, before I step out and allow the um, PRO to make his contributions, I want to acknowledge once again the Education Committee and the good work you're doing. So um, I, I am so proud of you in all this. Um, to you all, I want to say keep watching out and um, we will surely ensure that um, we give it to you just the way you want it to be. And please give us your suggestions directly to the Education Committee or to the NSA SOE. So, having said that, I want to tell all of us that um, please, tomorrow is the real birthday of our former president, Pa Oladako. Sergeant Commodore Olani Oladako is having his real birthday tomorrow. The past week's birthday celebration was that put up by the Lagos State Anesthesia Society. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow is his real day. So let's not be um, tired of still wishing him and thanking, and, and thanking yeah, him for all he has done for us. And um, having said that, um, I want to say thank you to every one of you. Um, we had over 200, 213 at a point participants here. And um, we are so happy with all of you. Please, you find the um, like the coordinator said, all discussions, all presentations, because of the open education resources policy of NSA, they are open to everyone. So, because education should be free and readily accessible, 
based on WHO's standard right now. So there's nothing hidden. All our subjects are open for you to you know, learn from later. So having said that, I want to call on the um, PRO NSA, Dr. Shelley, to give us whatever few announcements are left so that we can close this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, man. And good evening, everyone, our trainers, our professors, and all our esteemed members. Uh, we want to thank all our members that have been able to pay their dues this year, 2023. I want to use this opportunity to implore others to please kindly pay your 2023 NSA dues uh, so that we can help serve you better. And you can pay into this account. Of course, I posted it on our uh, chat box and in our, uh, on our NSA platform, but you can take the numbers. We use a GTB account. The number are 023-6648291. I take it again, 023-6648291, Nigeria Society of Anesthetists GTB account. And please, we want to also let you know that after this presentation, as soon as the recording is made available, it will be posted on our YouTube channel, Nigeria Society of Anesthetists. So you can always go back to the YouTube channel of Nigeria Society of Anesthetists to watch the presentation again. And please kindly follow us on all our social media handles. We are all on virtually all the social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Telegram, and even YouTube. So please kindly follow us on all these handles so that you can see all our messages and uh, announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shelley. The Education Committee Chair is um, having his hands up. Over to you, Dr. Deti. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, you've said everything I wanted to say. Um, there are other notable figures here. I think I've seen Professor Lebe also there. Thank you. Uh, oh, then welcome, there's one of our friend, somebody from Uganda who has been there before even the time, 30 minutes before the time he was there. Uh, Eddie, his name, I don't know, but I could see Masuzio also, Diambo from Zambia, who is also a critical care uh, physician. Now, um, I want to say that the ICCSN responded to our request to present this topic. And then uh, Muiwa, I think, is a one-time secretary of the association. So this area, we tried to give it to this uh, society that uh, um, can do justice to the topic. So we thank the ICCSN for that uh, collaboration. And next week, it will be on airway management. And then the Society of Specialists in Airway Management has also uh, responded positively to our request and they, they are members, some, they, have, uh, they have given these topics to two people to present uh, the topic. Tomorrow, the SAM, that is the Society of Specialists in Air Management, same time, 5 p.m., they have a webinar presentation of overview of laryngeal anatomy and predictors of difficult airway. Please let us all uh, join and uh, learn from this presentation. Thank you very much, Madam President. Okay, I'm also reading on the chat that um, the nurses are in our midst in this meeting. We welcome you all, our dear Nightingales. We know what you're doing in intensive care units and um, we appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. We hope to continue working with you and um, join hands with you in more further collaboration. I cannot stop without recognizing our mama, our mentor of mentors, a former NSA president, Professor Enola Elegbe. Welcome, ma. we appreciate you. I guess I didn't see your name on the, on the um, your name is customized perhaps. Welcome, ma. we appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. I can also see Dr. Kenneth Adegoke. He's also a stalwart in intensive care. I saw, I saw his name. Dr. Adegoke, thank you for taking out time to join us. 
we welcome you, we welcome everyone. So it's been a day, we want to call it um, a day finally, and um, have a lovely evening, everyone. See you next week. Good night. Good night, ma'am. Thank you, Madam President. My pleasure. Welcome, welcome. <laughs>